very special time of the year, a time of reflection, of planning, of coming before the Lord, worthy, worthy in Christ alone. And I want to talk today about the subject of covenant, because covenant is something that we don't think about a lot, although there's probably, as in your Christian journey, two great covenants you'll make. One will be in marriage, and one will be in baptism. And at some point, these two covenants are very closely related, because in marriage, Lord said, when, let what God has joined together, what God has joined them together, let not man put asunder, let not man tear apart. And I want to talk a little bit about covenant in the lead up to the Christian Passover, or actually known as the Lord's Supper. Because Adam and Eve were brought together in the Garden of Eden, and we see the pattern of exclusive, monogamous, lifelong marriage. And it's a covenant. And you covenant in the presence of these witnesses before God in heaven to love, to cherish. And, um, and Jesus reflected on that in the Gospels. He said, what God has joined together, let not man separate. There's a joining together for life. Then the next example of covenant we see is with Noah. God talks about covenant before the flood and after the flood, and we see a sign of a rainbow, where God says to Noah, I covenant with you that man will never be wiped out by a flood again. And there's a relationship between Noah and God. And we have the sign of the rainbow in the sky today. The next time, no, no, I'm highlighting a few milestones in covenant. Covenant is so powerful, it's mentioned in Scripture 331 times in 295 verses. So it's not a small subject. It's a big subject. God made a covenant with Abraham. And the outward sign of covenant as given to Abraham was circumcision. They were an exclusive, special people connected to the Lord. Abraham believed God when he looked at the stars and he said that all his prodigy would be like the stars of heaven and the sand of the seashore. And it was a credit to him as righteousness. Even though he says to God, I'm a hundred years old, and Sarah's ninety. Um, how does this work? Please let Ishmael be the child of promise. God says, no, no, no. In this covenant, you will bear one from your own flesh. The next time we come to covenant is in Sinai. It's called the Sinaitic Covenant with Moses. And God covenants with ancient Israel, a relationship where you read through the prophets. He compares it with marriage where Israel went off whoring after other, instead of being exclusively with God. And we see that covenant with ancient Israel, and yet they broke covenant. They couldn't keep covenant. And then the next covenant that we see is when the Messiah came, Jesus Christ. And all that had happened before was foreshadowing what the Messiah would do. Remember, part of the Passover in ancient Israel, derived its name from the slain lamb while they were leaving Egypt, and they painted the doorposts and the lintels with blood, and the death angel passed over them. In that sense, all that history of that slain lamb now focuses on God in the flesh. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, focuses on Jesus. And all the past covenants would sort of pale into insignificance, into the covenant relationship that we have with Jesus Christ, where we are now written under a new covenant, a new relationship where God said, I will write my law in their hearts and in their minds by the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So we are truly the new creatures. So all of history pointed to in shadow covenants of the real covenant in Jesus Christ. And when this happened was on a night some 2,000 years ago when Jesus said, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. And in today's world, the specialness of covenant is lost. You notice that the ancient Israelites ate Passover roast lamb and bitter herbs as part of covenant. Now, there, were, there can be no forgiveness of sin unless there's the shedding of blood. Blood. 
and the shedding of blood, the ancient Israelites weren't allowed to eat blood because Jesus said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, which was offensive to the Jewish mind, so they, instead of drinking the blood, they ate the roast lamb. Instead, that was okay, you could eat the lamb. So, um, today's sense of covenant is lost. We don't have that kind of richness of culture or tradition and even marriage is under threat. That's why in that little video I had to mention it because it's been on my mind. The definition of the sanctity of male and female, monogamous, exclusive, lifelong, holy, with Christ in them and through them, is gone. We live in an adulterous generation. We live in a perverted, unholy generation where what, you, what men and women do, they steal from one another, they covet. Totally wrong. And in our society, the media is to blame. The judiciary is to blame. The politicians carry that legislation, legislation on through. The legislators. And it all have contributed to the sacrilege of covenant. So that's why I've put the word up there and emblazoned it in silver and sparkles to somehow convey visually the sanctity and holiness of covenant because on people it's lost, but it's not lost on the followers of Jesus. Every year we gather together and we just go, oh, I'm so glad to be here. Just like Jesus said, I've eagerly desired this moment. In heaven scales, covenant weighs a lot. It's very important. Um, and today we reflect on the first part of the Bible up until the beginning of Matthew on the old covenant and we try to understand what we can learn from it as we live and participate in the new covenant. This leads us to the question, in being followers of Jesus who keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus, do we live by everything in the Bible? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Do we obey all that God's commanded? I'm asking you this because covenant is binding. It means that we submit totally to the word of God. Now, I know I'm asking a rhetorical question because the simplistic answer is to ignore the progressive story of salvation of how much better the covenant under Jesus Christ is than all the previous covenants that highlight, especially in the Sinaitic covenant with Moses. Because the new Messiah covenant in Christ pales into shadow what happened with ancient Israel. For example, those of us who've got a Bible can turn to Leviticus 23, where these are the feasts of the Lord, begins with the weekly Sabbaths, and then it talks about all the feasts, Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, Pentecost, trumpets, atonement, tabernacles, last great day. On the first of feast fruits, in Leviticus 23, verse 18, we have the Lord commands to have two loaves of fine flour, seven lambs, one bull, two rams, grain, food and drink offerings. He commanded them and he also said a statute forever in all your dwelling places throughout your all generations. So why don't we have one bull and seven lambs and drink offerings? Because God commanded it. Very interesting question because it reflects on the nature and the power of the new covenant and how the old covenant served its purpose, but it wasn't, isn't binding on us because the new covenant is so much better. But it's a good question to ask. A very good question to ask to understand what do we live by and how do we live by it because in the previous verse, these are all commanded. Now, you already know the answer, but it's nice to be able to look at the book of Hebrews, because the book of Hebrews provides a significant answer. And if you've got the moment now, turn to the book of Hebrews, because some scriptures I'll have on the screen, but some scriptures I won't have on the screen, because the book of Hebrews clearly discusses the nature of the old covenant and the nature of the new covenant, and how much better the mediation of the new covenant is. Because under the old covenant, there was no forgiveness of sin. They went through the motions of it. It was only in Christ that we can have forgiveness of sin. And the book of Hebrews teaches us that the old covenant is obsolete. Let me go to the book of Hebrews here. As it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old covenant as the covenant he mediates is better since it's enacted on better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. The ancient Israelites could not keep covenant with God. They tried, 
They couldn't. And it just shows just how much and how powerful the covenant of the word of the God is. Let me take the next verse 13. In speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete and what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. When the book of Hebrews was written, we believe that the temple was still standing before 70 AD. But the author of Hebrews, whether it was Paul or Barnabas, reflects on the fact that the, that the temple, the, the practices of old were becoming obsolete. You know, when John speaks of the Feast of Tabernacles, he speaks of the Feast of the Jews. Now, there's, nothing, there's a lot that we can gain because all these feasts and these holy days, annual Sabbaths, point to Jesus Christ. But under the terms of the Old Covenant, they don't apply to us. But I will explore that in a moment. The Old Covenant simply foreshadowed the salvation that we would have in Christ. The New Covenant supersedes the old and ratifies its superior legitimacy not in lamb's blood. That's the difference. In the blood of Jesus himself. The lamb's blood was only just a shadow. The shadow of the whole story of salvation is in Abraham. Ready to sacrifice Isaac. We have great empathy for Abraham and for poor Isaac. And what is sacrificed? A ram, a male lamb have horns caught in the thicket. Why did God so conspicuously place a ram there at the end of the story? The symbolism was there. Right from... And we sort of wonder, well, what's else to learn? We empathise with God the Father, having to sacrifice His Son, giving up the oneness that they'd shared. Because Jesus said, I'm going to pay everyone's sin. In a victory that's so powerful... And so therefore, that's why Jesus' name is exalted so high. He says, restore to me the glory, in John chapter 7, that I had with you before the world existed. So he divests himself, not counting, as the, as, as the scripture says, equality with God, something to be grasped, but came in the form of a human and lived a sinless life and was only the only way of paying for our sins. Let me go back to Hebrews chapter 8, um, chapter 8, verse 8. For he finds fault, I don't have that on the screen, for he finds fault with them when he says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. For they did not continue in my covenant, and I showed no concern for them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant that I'll make with the house of Israel in the days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, in verse 10, and they will be my people. In speaking of a new covenant, in Hebrews 8.13, he makes the first one obsolete. And then we go to the Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body have you prepared for me. So greater than the sacrifices and the offerings and the bulls and the lambs was the body of Christ. In burnt offerings and in sins you've taken no pleasure. Because even though the ancient Israelites did all those things, they couldn't keep covenant. They still had their ishtaras and baals in the mountains. When I, verse 7, then I said, Behold, said the Lord Jesus, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. All that Jesus experienced in suffering and dying wasn't plan B. It was written in the book and the scroll for ordained at creation that we might be God's children, that we might be saved. In verse 9, he does away with the first covenant in order to establish the second. That to me I've highlighted in, in yellow because we don't keep the old covenant requirements of an ephah of fine flour, of a bull, of seven rams, etc. We don't keep circumcision. The big issue in first century Christianity was wrestling with circumcision because so many people in the body of Christ had a Jewish tradition and they said all the Gentiles have to be circumcised to be people of the covenant. No, said the apostles. That was a previous covenant. 
To, if you get circumcised, you're like, big deal, it doesn't matter. The sacrifices don't mean anything. They've passed on, they've, they've set there, they've been a precedent for what is happening in the, in the future. Let's turn to the next page, next scripture, Hebrews 10, 16. This is the covenant I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. It was funny, you know, when God, Jesus, Moses came down from Mount Sinai, the first set of Ten Commandments, Moses walked in and there was a golden calf and pagan celebrations. And he was so dismayed, down went the tables of stone and they fractured. God had written his word on tables of stone. He says, I'm going to write it on your hearts because you could not keep my word. In verse 17, then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Verse 18 is very important. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Because we have been forgiven, why offer sacrifices? Because the mediation of the new covenant of God, of Christ, in Christ, forgives us all of our sins, why then offer a sin offering? Because it's all past. It, the mediation of what Christ did is so much greater. Where there is forgiveness of these, of sins, there's no longer any offering. And the book of Hebrews highlights that beautifully. And I take great encouragement of that. So we do not celebrate the Hebrew Passover with the roast lamb and the bitter herbs. It served its purpose. What Jesus did, he said, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Then he says to the disciples, go and prepare the Passover that the master may eat the Passover. So off they went, they found the man, they went upstairs, and what would have the disciples did? They didn't know he was going to have bread and wine and foot washing. They prepared the Passover. So the best that we can understand is that they had the Hebrew Passover. But at a particular point in the meal, Jesus gets up and takes a towel. Something from that point onwards supersedes what was happened in the past and begins to happen. So um, when Jesus takes that towel, he did it See, what happens in Hebrew tradition, in first century tradition, when you come into the room, the lowest of slaves would offer to welcome you by washing your feet. Jesus takes the role of at the beginning of something new to begin to wash the disciples' feet. And he has quite a conversation with Peter, because Peter says, no, and Jesus says, unless I do this with two of you, you have no part in me. Then he says, wash all my body. And Jesus says, no, just your feet. And then he says, as I've done to you, so you do to one another. He did something very unique at that particular point. And then the second thing that he did was he, while that, he takes bread, he breaks it, he blesses it, he says, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. The second thing that he did. The third thing is to me is the most powerful because when we eat, his, have Christ in us, we symbolise just through symbolism, the richness of living Christ in us. Then Jesus, I put this little cup here because every year I put that in the middle of the table as a reminder of the Paschal season. He, the, he first mentions covenant not with a foot washing, not with a bread. He mentions covenant when it comes to the cup. And the cup the fruit of the vine, that's why I went out and snipped some grapevines today. Because the fruit of that vine became what was sitting in that cup there 2,000 years ago. And he says in Luke chapter 22, verse 20, This cup that is poured out for you is a new covenant in my blood. Then he says, drink of it, all of you. So the initiation of covenant is no longer eating roast lamb. It's taking that cup or on Lord's Supper night, a little cup like that, and the act of taking a sip is the act of covenant taking, where the, the blood that was shed for us, symboled in the wine, is taken in us. That is the moment we renew covenant. That is the most powerful moment, and our job today is to clearly understand and be able to articulate and explain to somebody the difference between the old covenant and the new covenant. 
How similar they are in pointing to the Messiah, but how different in outcome and how far superior the second, the new covenant is. And the question is, can we explain it? Now, some things in the old covenant point so strongly to Jesus that we can have value in them. For example, the Church of God Seventh Day in Portugal keeps the annual holy days. But the Church of God Seventh Day throughout the world basically says, don't keep them under the terms of the Old Covenant, don't use it as a test of salvation or a requirement for salvation or a test of fellowship. So you're not going to do it under the Old Covenant with roast lamb and, and tabernacles living underneath bamboo huts, uh, um, living in a hut. But you might be able to find some value from Passover, the lamb, the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth that Paul was teaching to the Corinthians, to Pentecost with the coming of the Holy Spirit, trumpets the return of Jesus, right through to the last great day of the white throne judgment, etc. And so we don't throw out the teachings of God's word entirely, but we see value in Christ and Christ alone. The moment we take our minds of Jesus Christ and try to assume something else, like those Pharisees try to live by the Torah and never put their eyes on Jesus and therefore they were guilty of Jesus' blood. See the overt sign of the old covenant was circumcision right from Abraham through the Sinaitic covenant right even Paul sometimes circumcised and sometimes didn't and you wonder why well Paul what are you doing? Timothy he did, Titus he didn't because it was so richly entrenched in his work that um, but Paul himself writes that this has no effect anymore. It's the cleanliness and righteousness of our hearts before the Lord that God wants, rather than ritualistic appearances. Let's wrap this up now. I'll turn to um, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and I'd like you to turn to there as well, because we don't have those scriptures on the screen. I've only got one there on the screen. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 3, And you show that you are a letter from Christ, delivered by us. You are a letter, English standard, not written with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of the human heart. This is where God says, I will write my word into their hearts. So you are a letter from Christ, so to speak, because the word of God is written into your heart. Such is the confidence we have through Christ towards God because of his life, because of his death, because of his resurrection and his ascension and he's paying for us our sin. Well, this is the confidence we can have through Christ. Verse 5, not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God who has made us, says Paul, to be ministers of a new covenant. This is something that we've got to, we're stewards of. We, this is what we live under, this is what we share, this is what we explain. Not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. 1 Corinthians 11 now, 1 Corinthians 11. This is where Paul is writing on the occasion of the Lord's Supper to a Gentile community of believers who were struggling. They had the Lord's Supper, they, it was gluttonous occasion and some of them got drunk. Paul is saying, oh dear, we have work to do. So he writes, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. This is exactly what we're going to do. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in verse 25, In the same way, he took the cup, and after supper, saying, this is where the word covenant is mentioned first up. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The book of Hebrews tells us, fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. The good work that Jesus has begun us will be brought to completion in Christ. For as often as you eat this bread, and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I can't wait till Jesus comes. My covenant with Rebecca is until death do us part. My covenant 
is to proclaim the Lord's death and loyalty to Jesus, the redemption I have through his blood sacrifice, until he comes. Then Jesus says, I will not eat of this or drink of the fruit of the vine until I do it with you again in my Father's kingdom anew. So this unfinished business yet to happen, what we are celebrating will be carried over to the marriage supper of the Lamb. You notice that the marriage celebrations today, we finish with a, a, a wedding breakfast, a meal together, and it's a, for some reason we have toasts. I remember at our wedding we toasted to the Queen and, we, and people toasted to a long happy marriage and we did it with a glass of bubbly or apple juice, whatever it was in our hands. On Thursday night, those of us who are baptised will be participating in that and those of us who are not baptised, please come and listen and absorb and yearn for the moment when you will totally surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ. I have been, ten years ago, I, um, I bought a book from Ronald L. Dart from Christian Education Ministries called Law and Covenant. And I read quite a few chapters of that again yesterday. I just wanted to immerse myself in a book that had a profound on my thinking on covenant. On the back of his book, and you can get it for Amazon, um, he says, as I close, covenant is closely related, closely, closely related to law because it is about knowing God personally, intimately, and about being in a relationship with him. Nothing is more central to the Christian relationship with God than the covenant we have with Jesus. In this covenant, you actually carry His name. You are family with all the rights, privileges and obligations of a brother or a son. Rebecca carries my name, classic for example, in our tradition. We carry Jesus' name with all the rights and all the privileges and all the honour. That's why we always pray in Jesus' name. That's kind of powerful. So when we come to renew and celebrate covenant, may God's Spirit mightily move in our minds, strengthen our hearts to really perceive and renew ourselves in the power of forgiveness and the strength of enduring covenant. May God bless us as we prepare in the next few days. Mm -hmm.